Thank you for this opportunity to talk to you about some of the key findings of the recent Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Working Group 2 report on impacts, adaptation and vulnerability to climate change, and to discuss some of the implications of those findings for the continent of Africa. It's very clear from the Working Group 2 assessment that Africa is facing a changing climate. The report indicates that there are increasing mean and extreme temperature trends across the continent that can be attributed to human-induced climate change. We're also seeing that climate change has increased the frequency, intensity, and duration of heat waves and drought on the continent. For example, the probability of marine heat waves has doubled for most of Africa. Multi-year drought is now more frequent in West Africa. And the Cape Town drought, which occurred between 2015 and 2017, was made three times more likely as a result of human-induced climate change. But this climate change is happening against the backdrop of one of the most vulnerable regions of the world. And the high levels of exposure and vulnerability we see in Africa are created by a complex mix of socioeconomic, political, environmental, and historical factors. For example, Africans are disproportionately employed in climate exposed sectors. 55 to 62% of the workforce in Sub-Saharan Africa is employed in agriculture. 95% of cropland is rain fed. We're also seeing across the continent that there is a growth of populations, infrastructure and agriculture in areas exposed to climate hazards, for example, low-lying coastal areas. In sub-Saharan Africa, 56% of the urban population lives in informal settlements, often without access to basic services. And this increases the vulnerability of groups such as women and children and the elderly. In sub-Saharan Africa, 66% of the urban workforce is in informal employment. And again, this increases the vulnerability of these communities. The assessment also shows us that mortality from floods and storms and droughts is 15 times higher in highly vulnerable countries, many of which occur in Africa. So what do these climate changes mean for the continent of Africa? Well, it's clear from observed impacts that Africa has already experienced widespread losses and damages in key development sectors that can be attributed to human-induced climate change. These include changes in food production, in water provision, in public health services. We can see the impact of climate change on health in Africa if we look at the increasing incidence of malaria in East Africa because of increasing temperatures, increased cholera outbreaks, especially following tropical cyclones in East Africa and Southern Africa. In terms of rising temperatures, the health of tens of millions of Africans is impacted through exposure to extreme heat. 43.8% of heat-related mortality from 1991 to 2018 is attributable to climate change in South Africa. Malnutrition is a serious concern in Africa. Children in sub-Saharan Africa are particularly at risk of undernutrition and mortality from increasing temperatures. And all of these impacts are compounded by damage to health facilities and medical services created by, for example, flood damage in urban areas. Food security is another priority for Africa. The Working Group 2 assessment shows us that the growth in agricultural productivity was reduced by 34% since 1961 due to climate change. In sub-Saharan Africa, between 1974 and 2008, maize yields decreased by 5.8% and wheat yields decreased by 2.3%. Currently, two thirds of Africans perceive that climate conditions for agricultural production have worsened over the past 10 years. Water security is a key priority for Africa. We are a water stressed continent. The assessment points to the fact that Africa is experiencing more variable rainfall and river discharge. In Eastern and Southern Africa, river flows and lake levels showed largely decreasing trends between 1970 and 2010. And these impacts on the water system have had negative and cascading impacts on multiple sectors, including hydropower generation. But we're not only concerned about the impacts of climate change on human communities in Africa, we're also concerned about the impacts on Africa's ecosystems. And the Working Group 2 assessment shows us that we're currently experiencing losses of marine biodiversity, reduced lake productivity, changes in the geographic ranges of both animal and plant species. Examples of these impacts include mass coral bleaching events in East Africa and woody plant expansion into savannas and grasslands, which are producing a decrease in water supplies and reducing the grazing land available. And we're concerned about these impacts on Africa's ecosystems because of the high and direct human dependence we still have in Africa on the ecosystem services that come from these ecosystems. They support many lives and livelihoods on the continent.
We also know too that changing climatic conditions are important drivers of migration and displacement in Africa. If we look to the two years, 2018 and 2019 respectively, we can see 2.6 million and 3.4 million new weather related displacements in Sub-Saharan Africa. There are also increasing movements from rural to urban environments as a result of droughts and extreme temperatures being experienced in rural areas. Most climate related migration is within countries or between neighboring countries and involves mainly middle income households. But we're also seeing involuntary immobility caused by reduced financial resources that are the result of climate change impacts. Displaced populations are more vulnerable, which is obviously of great concern on a vulnerable continent because, for example, of the legal and economic barriers they encounter. These impacts on the human and natural systems of the continent have reduced economic growth across Africa, leading to losses in key systems and key sectors such as agriculture, tourism, manufacturing and infrastructure provision. Between 1991 and 2010, GDP per capita declined on average by 13.6%. And this has increased income inequality between African countries and countries in more temperate Northern Hemisphere climates. Reduced productivity also leads to lower macroeconomic performance. In a rural town in South Africa, for example, 80% of businesses lost more than 50% of their employees in revenues due to agricultural drought. We're also seeing losses at the individual, household and community level. One assessment indicated that 60% of households reported net losses despite formal aid and their own adaptive responses. Climate change also undermines traditional knowledge of livelihoods, it undermines sense of place, it undermines cultural heritage, puts it at risk in areas that are experiencing sea level rise, for example. The negative impacts of climate change, such as declining crop yields and higher prices, often fall on the most vulnerable members of our communities. And responses such as selling off livestock and land leads to chronic poverty. Climate change also affects childhood development and educational attainment. Drought experienced during early life can lead to 1.8 fewer years of completed schooling in Western and Central Africa, and a 14% reduction in lifetime earnings in Zimbabwe. We clearly are in a very challenged present state, but what does the assessment tell us about the future still to come? Well, the Working Group 2 assessment is very clear. The risks for Africa will increase with increased levels of global warming. And we can see this illustrated in this burning embers diagram taken from the Working Group 2 assessment, which looks at selected key risks for the continent against increasing levels of global warming. It shows us that above 1.5 degrees of global warming, risk in Africa will be high. The chances of large scale regional crop losses increase. We can expect increasing poverty, drought and displacement. Above two degrees of global warming, the risks become very high. Widespread crop yield losses, widespread heat related mortality risk. We can expect that between seven to 18% of species in Africa could be at risk of extinction. We can also expect an over 30% decline in fisheries catch potential in some parts of Africa and that there will be severe risks of malnutrition. So what are the adaptation options available to Africans? How effective are they? Are there limits? From the Working Group 2 assessment and from the observed adaptation that's recorded in the literature, we can determine that the bulk of adaptation options are fragmented, they're local, they're incremental. They primarily associate with individuals and households, national governments, NGOs, and international institutions. We have much more limited reporting of adaptation action by subnational governments and the private sector. For example, 89% of African cities with more than a million inhabitants reported no adaptation initiatives. Indigenous knowledge and local knowledge can reduce vulnerability. The assessment showed that there's greater drought resilience amongst, amongst crop and livestock farmers in South Africa and Uganda, where they were using local and indigenous knowledge. Social and environmental protection programs can also enhance adaptive capacity, for example, through the provision of free basic services in South Africa. Examples of observed adaptation recorded in the Working Group 2 report include behavioral adaptation in response to drought and flooding and rainfall variability. We also see changing crops and livestock in the agricultural sector. We see ecosystem-based adaptation being used to improve water security. Now this focus on nature is important because nature offers significant untapped potential. Not only to deal with the impacts of climate change, but to deal with the causes of climate change and also to improve lives and livelihoods on the African continent. Agroforestry, for example, is a good and climate resilient way 
of not only producing food crops, but also enhancing wildlife habitat. Here we see a Nigerian rubber farmer, not only growing rubber trees, but fruit trees and food crops and keeping bees as part of a diversified livelihood strategy. Other adaptation options called out in the Working Group 2 report that have relevance to Africa include those involved in securing food security, for example, sustainable agricultural practices, the intensification of agricultural practices, the use of climate information services, improving the management of crop, livestock, and fisheries. And these generate wider benefits, such as improved food security, nutrition, improved health and well-being, and diversified livelihoods. Water management is also of key concern to Africa. Here, effective adaptation options highlighted in the report include irrigation, but the report also cautions about the potential depletion of groundwater supplies, the provision and use of bulk water infrastructure, but also the use of alternative water supplies, rainwater storage, and water saving technologies, all within the context of integrated water management can provide not only economic, but ecological benefits and can reduce the vulnerability of human and natural communities. There are also wider options available, such as securing drinking water for urban areas, working with nature by restoring wetlands, for example, land use planning, and using that mechanism to create no build zones, and flood and drought risk management, which is where the bulk of our adaptation activities are currently focused. But the report cautions that the effectiveness of all of these declines with greater warming. Cities offer us an enormous opportunity to increase our adaptive capacity. By the middle of the century, almost two thirds of the world population could be living in the world's urban areas. And this is significant for Africa because we're currently the most rapidly urbanizing region in the world. The adaptation options that are highlighted in the Working Group 2 assessment include using nature-based and engineering approaches together. So for example, using baby and mattresses together with flood restoration and river catchments establishing blue and green spaces in our cities, using urban agriculture to improve food security, and providing social safety nets for disaster management, not only to deal with the impacts of climate change, but to improve financial security. And these generate wider benefits, such as public health improvements and ecosystem conservation. Adaptation in informal settlements is also important to Africa, given the high levels of informality in our urban areas. And the Working Group 2 assessment calls out that we can achieve city scale impact if we use local knowledge together with appropriate skills, funding and tools, and ensure that policymakers engage with residents in decision-making. Governments can also enhance adaptive capacity by improving accountability, commitment and transparency in their activities. But how effective are these adaptation options? Well, the assessment of Working Group 2 indicates that adaptation in Africa has had multiple benefits but most of the assessed options have only medium effectiveness in reducing risks for present day levels of global warming. And it also points to the fact the effectiveness of current adaptation options will decrease with increasing global warming levels. There are also limits to adaptation, not only currently, but in the future. For example, physiological limits may render urban outdoor labor in Africa's cities and the keeping of livestock in some parts of Africa simply impossible. The report also underscores the potential for maladaptation. These are the unintended consequences that come from our adaptation actions. So for example, afforestation can impact on biodiversity and undermine water security. Competing uses of water, hydropower, irrigation ecosystems can create trade-offs for decision makers. Agricultural adaptations, such as expanding agriculture into forested areas or increasing charcoal production during droughts, can have negative consequences such as increasing greenhouse gas emissions. Land use and land ownership changes may marginalize the most vulnerable in our communities and flood proofing using hard infrastructure may impact on biodiversity and increase long-term risk for communities. So the question then is, given the range of impacts we're facing, given the high levels of vulnerability in our continent, how do we move forward in an integrated and sustainable way? The Working Group 2 assessment indicates that we really are in charge of our future. We, through our decisions, can choose to have a future that's marked by high resilience and low risk, while alternatively our decisions can equally take us towards a low resilience and high risk future. Where we land on the spectrum is really determined by the extent to which we reduce climate risk through adaptation, the extent to which we reduce greenhouse gases through mitigation, the extent to which we invest in important system transitions, such as enhanced biodiversity and sustainable cities and settlements, all with a view to achieving the sustainable development goals 
And it's this integration of adaptation, mitigation, and sustainable development that working group two refers to as climate resilient development. The question is, how do we enable climate resilient development in Africa? Well, research is critical. Currently, only 3.8% of global research funding between 1990 and 2019 was spent on Africa. And of that, only 14.5% went to African institutions. We must also fill data gaps and ensure a steady flow of data around weather, agriculture, and census data. And that can be enhanced by improved collaboration between local leaders and researchers. Improving climate literacy is also important. Currently, only 23 to 66% of Africans are aware of climate change, its causes and implications. And at the subnational level, that can be as low as 5%. We also need to build capacity to take complex decisions in the face of uncertainty. Governance is also a very important tool for enhancing climate resilient development, particularly where it's inclusive, locally led, and leads to benefit sharing. Legislation can also help us promote coordination between various spheres of government and entrenched policy. Ecosystem-based adaptation allows us to protect, restore, and conserve ecosystems while providing social, economic, and environmental benefits. And cross-sectional approaches can help us maximize co-benefits and minimize maladaptation across a variety of sectors. But as always, there are financial constraints. The Working Group 2 assessment shows us that adaptation costs will rise rapidly with global warming in Africa. Transformative adaptation on the continent can be facilitated through increased public and private finance flows of billions of dollars per year by increasing direct access to multilateral funds, strengthening the project pipeline so we see more finance shifting into project implementation by providing concessional finance for adaptation in low income settings and aligning sovereign debt relief with climate goals. And so ultimately to paraphrase the key finding of the Working Group 2 report, the scientific evidence is unequivocal. Climate change is a threat to human well-being and the health of Africa and its ecosystems. Any further delay in concerted global action will miss the brief, rapidly closing window we have to secure a livable future for all Africans. If you're interested in the impact of climate change on Africa, you can find more information in the Working Group 2 report, most notably the chapter on Africa and the fact sheet that was prepared by Working Group 2 for Thank you very much again for this opportunity to talk to you about the Working Group 2 report and its implications for Africa.